Next, we're going to hear from Jessica Graham and Dana Velasco Murillo. Jessica Graham is an assistant professor in the Department of History. Her research explores the politics of race and nationalism in Brazil and the United States in the 1930s and 40s era. Dana Velasco Murillo is also an assistant professor in the Department of History. Her research interests center on the intersection of colonialism with gender, ethnicity, and identity formation in early Latin America. She specializes in the social history of colonial Mexico, particularly the responses of indigenous people to Spanish rule. Tonight, Jessica and Dana will discuss racial pluralism as a as a prominent feature in the history of the Americas. Using colonial Mexico and the United States and Brazil during the World War II era as case studies, their talk will consider how the racial construction of American societies reflects a series of political and social negotiations, the ramifications of which are still apparent today. Please join me in welcoming Jessica Graham and Dana Velasco Murillo. Thank you all for coming this evening, and thank you, Lauren, for the introduction. Today, Dana and I are going to discuss the invaluable function of history and the humanities in helping our students to understand, to navigate, and to flourish in our increasingly globalized world. Our research demonstrates the, that the Americas serve as an incredibly rich site to investigate the really popular notion of global citizenship, because the history of the Americas is based on the confluence of people and cultures from all over the world. In fact, our own very extraordinarily international community here at UC San Diego is evidence of this fact. Yet, our students often struggle with how to think through the processes that force together so many different people with different racial, cultural, and religious backgrounds. So this is where the humanities and historians like Dana and I come in. Our research and teaching about the Americas in particular provide an exceptional and necessary opportunity for our students to analyze the issues that they and all multiracial societies confront, such as racial inclusion and exclusion, cultural diversity, and social and political negotiations and struggles. But these are not only 21st or even 20th century phenomena. As Dana will show us, their origins in the Americas date all the way back to the first contacts between Native peoples, Africans, and Europeans in the 16th century. Good evening. My research centers on the history of indigenous peoples under Spanish colonial rule in Mexico, or what was then New Spain, from 1546 to 1810. I examine how Native peoples maintain their indigenous heritage as they embrace Spanish-style civic identities in Zacatecas, colonial Mexico's most important silver mining town. Now today, Zacatecas remains a charming UNESCO World Heritage Site, but in the 1540s, it was a barren, arid landscape at the northern edge of the empire. Uh, and this slide here to my left gives you an idea of what the city probably looked like before its urban development. Okay, so how did we go from this to this? It's one word, silver. The discovery of silver veins in 1546 spurred Spaniards to create a city from scratch. Now, Spanish society was basically an urban society, and the founding of a town was linked with the establishment of a municipal council from among its vecinos. This is our Spanish word for the day. Vecinos was the term that an individual used to denote that he or she belonged to a community, much in the same way that we use words like San Diegan and U.S. citizen to mark our local and national affiliations. Vecinos were long-term residents with both rights and responsibilities to community. And we can relate to this. We have voting rights. We have to pay taxes. But what was different about vecino status or vecindad in Spanish America was it was not formal or official. You did not apply for it. But implicit in the sense that an individual arrived at a site, declared their intent to stay, and then participated in civic and community life. Now, you might be wondering, who could be a vecino in Spanish America? Well, in the past, we often equated civic identity with Spanish identity. In other words, only Spaniards. But my research has uncovered that indigenous peoples were also vecinos. In fact, I argue that they were among the city's most important vecinos. After all, 
living in San Diego, the eighth largest city in the United States, we know that this huge, smooth operation of a city requires lots of labor, which is what Zacatecas initially didn't have. Unlike other places in Spanish America, Spaniards in Zacatecas did not have easy access to a coerced labor pool. So they had to offer incentives, wages among the most prominent, to encourage indigenous peoples, men, women, and children, to migrate to the city. And I created this map for you, which shows you the migration patterns of indigenous women to Zacatecas from 1770 to 1780 to give you an idea of how dependent the city was on indigenous immigrants from all areas of New Spain to meet its labor needs. Indigenous women ran its markets and cared for its children. Indigenous men worked in the silver mines, built its principal buildings, and grew and imported its foodstuff. Spanish officials often commented that the city could not have survived or prospered without the labor of its indigenous immigrant workforce. Now, like immigrants before and after them, native peoples relocated to Zacatecas with desires of establishing their own communities. Could they do this under a colonial system? Yes, just like their Spanish counterparts, they set about building their own towns. And if we focus on this map from 1730, we can see how four Indian towns, which I've highlighted for you in yellow, developed along the mint-colored Spanish core. Now, within these towns, native peoples established their own municipal councils, elected their own leaders and officials. They also built their own churches and organized their own religious societies or confraternities. Native peoples took great pride in their civic institutions and in identifying themselves as vecinos of Zacatecas or one of its Indian towns. Now, you might be wondering, did being a vecino imply that you had to give up your indigenous heritage? No, let me give you an example. In the native towns and even in the Spanish core, native peoples continue to speak indigenous language, languages. And here we have um, an example of an indigenous confraternity book from the 16th and 17th century in which native peoples kept their records in Nahuatl, the, lingua, the indigenous lingua franca of the city. So we see how even in cities, the administrative, demographic, and economic heart of colonial rule, native peoples could adapt Spanish-style civic identities as they continue to develop indigenous communities, identities, and practices. Why is this important? Because it helps us to understand that from its origins, the construction of multiracial societies in the Americas was based on accommodation and negotiation. So now I would like to propel us ahead a few hundred years to the tumultuous World War II era. We will stay in the Western Hemisphere, but we are going to shift our focus to the two largest and most populous nations in the Americas, Brazil and the United States. So as we shift from colonial Mexico to Brazil and the United States in the 1940s, I would like us to consider the effect of the passage of time on multiracial societies. For instance, I doubt that any one of us would think that the multiracial dynamics of colonial Zacatecas remain the same today, right? And why is that? Well, you might say, you know, because with the passage of time comes change. However, a hu human societies are not like our bodies. Time neither leaves a trace in the same way, nor does it alter appearances just because it has elapsed. So actually, no, it is not the passage of time itself that exacts change on multiracial communities, but rather the events that occur, especially the crises. It is often in moments of crisis that a society reassesses which groups are going to be included, as well as the terms and conditions of that inclusion. So what I plan to do here in the short amount of time that I have is to sketch how the conversation about racial inclusion in the United States during World War II changed, right, during this moment of crisis. And my particular research focuses on a generally unknown chapter of the story, which is the impact of Brazil on the United States. So very few people know that, that Brazil eventually sided with the United States and the Allies during World, World War II, or that in 1944, the South American giant sent about 25,000 troops to fight in Europe. And the image you see before you um, is representing this. This is um, a picture of Brazilian troops helping to liberate Italy. However, Brazil's many contributions to the military operation only partly explain why the country garnered such a great amount of attention from the United States. So of course you want to know what else did, right? First of all, the Allies considered the German and Japanese communities in Brazil to be, in their words, the largest and best organized in all of South America. Um, so 
Also, the Italian community that was in Brazil was extremely substantial. So the US authorities were essentially really concerned about where the true loyalties of these communities rested, right? And you had officials like FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover who were fretting over the fact that Brazil had up to four times as many Japanese immigrants and descendants as the United States. So the second thing that garnered so much attention from the United States in terms of Brazil, at the time, the Allied nations believed former Nazi leader Hermann Rauschening, who wrote that Brazil and Hit I'm sorry, Hitler was especially interested in Brazil and had plans to create a new Brazil there. Worse yet, and you see this represented in, in this, um, this image here, US intelligence agents declared that the Brazilian coastline was, in their words, a likely bridgehead for enemy attack on the United States. And this is articulated in this image. You see, this is a, a booklet that the government published in 1943. And you see that at the top, it says that Brazil is a stepping stone for invasion. And you know, the Allies were actually not being paranoid. Hitler had designed a plan to invade the United States vis-a-vis -vis Brazil. So you see, you know, the furthest point east is the northeastern region of Brazil, Rio Grande do Norte, which is the, the, the state of the capital city, Natal. Hitler planned to invade from Dakar, Senegal. It invade Brazil. From Brazil, he would invade the Caribbean. And from the Caribbean, he planned to attack the United States through its Gulf Coast. So as you can see, there were ample reasons for Brazil to garner so much attention from the United States, right? With this in mind, you can imagine that US authorities were extremely alarmed when the Axis nations, even the Nazis, took every effort and every opportunity to exploit racial inequality in the United States in order to recruit the support of the multiracial Brazilian people. Because you see, Brazil liked to, to think of itself as a truly racially tolerant society. This is the central component of Brazilian national identity. And Brazil hailed the largest black population in all of the Americas by far. So this is why one US report labeled the racial issue as an extremely vulnerable point for the United States wartime objectives in Brazil. So for example, in Brazil, the Japanese broadcasted stories about the cases of racial discrimination in the United States, or the wartime race riots that occurred in cities like Detroit, which my mother actually lived through as a little girl. British intelligence even warned the United States that the Axis nations were spreading stories in Brazil that the United States planned to introduce, in the words of the British, a color bar similar to that operating in the southern states of the USA. So in other words, the Axis nations were actually saying and claiming that US-style racial integration would be imported into Brazil if the Allies won the war. And such stories would not only disturb black identified Brazilians. Most Brazilian citizens found US racial customs during the 1940s as extremely disagreeable and profoundly un-Brazilian. So somehow, the United States had to convince multiracial Brazil that the US was not racist if the US wanted to truly secure the allegiance of the Brazilian people and thus protect US strategic and defense interests. And so for this and other international as well as domestic reasons, US policymakers discussed the problem of racism in the United States with a new sense of purpose. New affirmations were made about the importance of racial inclusion and the need for the United States to at the very least transmit a freshly multiracial image of the United States. And the government actually even presented the issue of Japanese and Japanese-American internment during, during World War II as the act of an inclusive society. So wrapping up, you have the wartime moment, the United States interconnectivity with and dependence upon multiracial societies like Brazil, the horrors of Nazism, and very critically, the emergent domestic civil rights movement come together to beget a new commitment to racial inclusion in the United States. So this new image would create both opportunities for and challenges to the post-war civil rights movement, which would be the next major series of events that spawned a reassessment of racial inclusion in the United States, a reassessment that continues to this day.
So I think I have about 30 seconds left, but what I just want to say is that we hope, we hope you enjoyed this brief glimpse into our research. And we just want to take a few seconds to talk about how our work resonates beyond academic circles. Jessica and I included the phrase global citizens in our title because in many ways technology, media, and transportation have provided our students with unprecedented access to different peoples and places. But in yet, yet in many ways, our students continue to know little about societies and cultures around the globe. This is where the critical role of an education in the arts and humanities at UC San Diego comes into play. Our research and teaching serve as a platform, providing students with the content, ideas, and perspectives that they need to become engaged global citizens. Whether it's from seemingly unconnected events hundred years apart, our research and teaching strives to make connections. Perhaps learning about settlement patterns in colonial Zacatecas can inform our students about how to think about racial diversity residential patterns in metropolitan contemporary San Diego. In making these connections, the arts and humanities at UC San Diego helps to shape global citizens, individuals with both local and broad and historic and contemporary perspectives and skills. Thank you very much. Thank you.